going to talk about a new paper that uh, Max Tegmark and I uh, recently put out called Provably Safe Systems, The Only Path to Controllable AGI. Uh, here's a picture of the paper, and there's the uh, archive address. And amazingly, yesterday, Max was a part of a roundtable talking about AI safety with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, he head of Israel, and uh, Elon Musk, and uh, Greg Brockman, who's the CEO of OpenAI. And they had a really interesting discussion. There's the, the link to it down there. And early on, uh, um, Netanyahu was saying how much he enjoyed uh, uh, Max's book, uh, Life 3.0. And Max says, oh, if you think that was great. And he pulled out our paper <laughs> and handed it to him. And then they got into this great discussion about um, uh, you know, provable systems and uh, how we can make software better and all kinds of stuff. So I was like, amazing. <laughs> so that was a very ex little bit of excitement yesterday. Uh, so my agenda for today, and please ask questions or comments anywhere along the way, uh, is these nine points. Uh, the first is that AGI, artificial general intelligence, namely AI, which is as uh, smart as people in most, most areas, is imminent. Uh, AGI is an existential risk. It could, could lead to the extinction of humanity. Uh, that AI alignment, which is the current approach for dealing for, with that, is insufficient. That we need to take a security mindset. And we're going to argue, Max and I, that we what we need are what we're calling provably safe systems. And I'll describe what that is. Uh, and AI theorem proving is a critical piece of that story. And I'll argue that that is also quite imminent. Uh, and we also need cryptographically secure hardware. And I'll say more about that. And that I'll give an argument that this is the only path to safety, that if we don't do all of this, then it's very likely that it won't be a safe system. But if we successfully do all of this, it will lead to human thriving and we can solve uh, many of today's uh, problems. And so that's a very exciting, good, good news. So just on the bit of AGI and ASI, when is it coming? There are lots and lots of opinions, but over the past few years, it's been steadily decreasing. One way to sort of get some kind of objective measure is Metaculus, which is a prediction market where people somewhat in the know vote and bet on uh, different outcomes of different things. There are two related to AGI. One is kind of a weak AGI, which is when will AI systems be as good at humans on things that can be done over the internet? Uh, and that one is predicting March 1st, 2027 currently. Uh, the stronger one is AGI with robots and sort of physical interactions. And that's like uh, January 18th, 2032. And uh, once AGI shows up, presumably it'll be used to improve AI. And so there's ASI or artificial super intelligence. The question is how soon after AGI shows up do we get ASI and the current estimate is nine months. So who knows if these guys are right. But And many uh, luminaries, like the head of Anthropic, just said he thinks it's two to three years away, uh, and other people are giving very, very short timelines. So I would expect that the next decade will see some very dramatic things and that we really should be preparing, you know, as humanity. I mean, this is very, very short timelines. And so this is a, kind of a, a wake-up call, if, if you like. Uh, many people are thinking that uh, this AGI may may uh, cause problems, and then many people are trying to analyze, you know, could human extinction come as a part of this? There's a famous uh, quote from the video, The AI Dilemma, that half of all AI researchers believe there's a greater than 10% chance of human extinction due to uncontrolled AGI. Um, a really nice uh, long paper from the AI uh, uh, AI safe from the Center for AI Safety uh, came out a few months ago, uh, which is an overview of catastrophic catastrophic risks, catastrophic AI risks, and they identify a whole bunch of uh, possible ways things could go bad. Uh, bioterrorism is pretty high on their list. Uh, automated warfare, power seeking rogue AIs, people using AIs to sort of uh, get power and to make money, all kinds of stuff. You can read the paper to see them all. Um, the current primary approach to dealing with these risks is what's called alignment. And that is trying to make sure that the values that an AI is trying to follow or achieve are aligned with human values. And all the big AI research labs are working hard on alignment. It's fantastic, great work. But I'm gonna argue that alignment will not solve this problem. Uh, and there are a bunch of reasons. Um, this uh, paper that came out a few months ago sort of shows one of them, that uh, large language models have to be aligned so that they don't say offensive things and they don't uh, you know, lie, cheat, and steal, do all kinds of bad stuff. 
Uh, and what this group found is that any alignment process that attenuates undesired behavior but does not remove it altogether is not safe against adversarial prompting attacks. So they found that you can find the right prompt that gets around any kind of uh, attempt at, at alignment in these language models. And so I would say we need not just probabilistic uh, guarantees that, oh, yeah, this model will usually be pretty good. We need adversarial guarantees. We need to shift our thinking to let's assume these models are acting adversarially. What do we do about it? And even if the top labs, you know, um, Google, DeepMind, uh, OpenAI, Anthropic, Meta, even if they have great teams, work out, do great aligned models, and that what they show to the world is nice and aligned. Uh, it's very likely that other groups won't be so well aligned and that there were likely to be some some groups that are malicious. that are trying to use AI for for bad purposes to, you know, earn lots of money to, for extortion, that sort of th thing. And so we need to build the world's uh, technology to deal with even uh, sort of negative or rogue AIs. And in fact, just uh, I think it was last week, there was a group of uh, AI company CEOs that met with Congress and had a lot of long closed door session. And uh, Tristan Harris was one of them there. And he just came out with a quote saying that with $800 and a few hours of work, his team was able to strip Meta's safety controls off of Llama 2, which is a large language model, and that that AI responded to prompts with instructions to develop a biological weapon. So that's an example of an open source model being perverted to do something that it wasn't intended to do. So uh, I really like this book from uh, Nancy uh, Levison called Engineering a Safer World, which suggests that what we really need is a security mindset, which applies systems thinking to safety and how to build systems which are actually robustly safe. And how do you do that? Well, you need to model the capabilities of the adversary. And we have we can we can model what AGIs are going to be like. We have as a lower bound what the current models are doing. Current uh, large language models are able to write code. They're able to prove theorems. They're able to design molecules. They're able to uh, manipulate people. They're able to uh, you know write spam emails. They're able to do all. And so we know we have a pretty good lower bound on what these things can do. Upper bound is really determined by physics. You know, no matter how powerful or smart or intelligent these systems are, they can't violate the laws of physics. So that gives us some limits on what we will be capable of doing. We then need to model the harms, and that's figuring out, well, what are the problems, and particularly what are the existential risks that could come out of this? Uh, and then we need to model the overall system, take a systems approach, is what are the components that enable those harms? And then we need to des create designs which provably prevent those harms. So, so that's the sort of mindset uh, I'd like to take here. And I'd like to distinguish between detailed rules and guardrails, uh, because I think, you know, people, when they hear this story, they say, oh, it'll be too complicated to write all the rules for the world and how it should work. And what we're suggesting here is really the primary thing we need to do is protect against the really bad uh, outcomes. And uh, in the case of driving, we have cars that are driving down the road, the detailed rules of how do you pass other cars and when do you signal, what is tailgating, what is speeding and what's allowed and what's not, those are complicated. Different people may have different ideas about what kind of driving is okay. And, and capturing all of that, you know, it's something they're trying to do with the self-driving cars. It's a hard thing. It's not, so, not such an easy thing. On the other hand, guardrails for driving is the main, main thing we want is your car should not drive over the cliff no matter what. And they've developed a very simple technology that's a little fence on the edges of roads that mostly when a car starts going over the cliff, it bounces off that and, and is safe. So guardrails can be crude and simple, but they provide protection against really hard things. In the case of AGI, we want a guardrail around something like take no actions which could lead to human extinction. And so all the subtleties of exactly how we should, you know, uh, operate society and so on are great, important, they're wonderful. But I think the safety, the existential safety is, is a much simpler kind of uh, constraint than that. So just to have something to think about, uh, one of the examples in that uh, Center for AI Safety paper uh, is a bioterror threat. And so we can sort of think, of th think through how a, a terrorist group might try and use AGI. They might use the AGI, which can design, say, uh, DNA for, you know, toxic uh, pathogenic viruses, uh, use the AGI to design the, the DNA for that and the protein shell of that virus. Then they ask the AGI to design the chemical synthesis steps to, to create that, uh, uh, that virus. 
uh, and integrate it into its protein shell. And then they hire a company to synthesize the DNA and another company to make the proteins and another company to bring it all together. So they get this pathogenic virus and then they maybe have AGI controlled drones, which will disperse the virus over some highly populated area, maybe Washington, DC. And then they uh, set, let loose a bunch of a AGI bots on social media to sort of spread their message and uh, talk about what they're doing. So that's something that today, you know, we, we have police and so on that try and stop this, but we really don't have any technological mechanisms that prevent that type of a story. So how would we thwart that? Uh, well, imagine we're in a world where all the technologies that we operate uh, require proofs of safety or proofs of obeying these kind of guardrail rules, then your design AGI won't design DNA uh, without a proof of safety. The data center GPUs won't run the rogue DNA AGI uh, and the GPUs won't run in rogue data centers because they're all checking for making sure that, uh, that, 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 that they're uh, satisfying these rules. DNA synthesis machines won't synthesize DNA without a proof of safety. Chemistry lab equipment won't do anything without a proof of safety. Drone control systems will check proofs of safety before the drones will fly. And social media will check proofs of humanness before they allow messages to spread throughout the society. So that's an example sort of, of what the shift of technology would look like so that um, it's robust against uh, just un un unharnessed uh, uh, AGIs. So, so what, Steve, yeah, go ahead. A question about, say, if you go back two slides, you, there's the, like the, the, maybe the high, the high order goal is, um, or actually one slide back, um, take no actions which could lead to human extinction. Well, that's certainly like, yeah, a, a guardrail we'd like to have. It seems so removed from what could be formally dealt with through proof. Do, um... Well, I mean, I, I'm seeing a kind of hierarchy of these constraints, and that's sort of at the top. And and mm -hmm. I would have probably at that level also like things like uh, you know the human rights constitution, uh, you know that that type of thing. And then, yeah. but the the more refined uh, um, kinds of statements are things like uh, you know a design. Uh, a DNA design uh, AGI uh, that has limits on what kind of DNA uh, it's going to produce. And right. so like like people are trying to produce toxins and, uh, in, you know, and there should be rules that constrain that. And we have human rules for that today, yeah. but they're not encoded in the equipment. And so they don't actually constrain the behavior of intelligent AIs. And so, so you know, there's a hierarchy here. And eventually, I think we want to have very nuanced and detailed things. But since we have a very short time scale, I think the critical thing at the moment is to really clamp down on the things which could be very dangerous. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I have a few follow up questions. I'll, I'll hold for later. Thanks. Okay, sounds good. So what do we need technologically? Let's say we let's say we like that story that this is something we want. What would we need? Well, first of all, we would need a way to express the safety rules for any risky device or system. We would need some way to check that the AI proposed actions, we have AIs that are trying to do things with these, uh, these tools, would meet those safety rules. We need to make sure that the rule checkers themselves aren't subverted. We need to make sure that the rule checkers actually control the devices and systems that they're supposed to. We need to make sure that the devices and systems themselves aren't subverted. And we need mechanisms to update the rules and we need ways to ensure that the rules we pick lead, of, lead to human thriving, which is sort of the issue you were, you were just bringing. So, wow, that's a lot to ask. Um, how do we do that? Well, there are a number of technologies, I think, uh, that are some are here and, and widely used and some are just emerging. And together, we call these technologies, uh, Max and I, provably safe systems. And so to express safety rules, we use formal specification and some logical language. And I'll mention a few uh, as, as a little bit uh, on the way. To check the safety rules, we need a proof checker, and they're very short. Like, an ex for an example, MetaMath has a 300-line program that, in like you know, a few seconds, can check all of you know 40,000 MetaMath theorems. And so, checking that a proposed action meets uh, rules uh, is actually fast and simple. If you're sure that that proof checker is really running properly, um, if you want to run code. That code has to prove that it, uh, you know, isn't going to run into a loop or do some bad thing. And there's a whole technology called proof carrying code for that. 
Fear improving is how you take some proposed set of actions and show that it meets some requirements. And uh, AI fear improving is moving ahead really rapidly. And finally, mechanistic interpretability is a subdiscipline that is taking deep learning neural nets and discovering what the mechanism uh, that underlies what, the, what they're proposing. And so that's a way to make what they do formal. Uh, to, to ensure that checkers are not subverted, we need to use uh, hope, preferably unbreakable cryptography. And I'll say a bit more about that. And we need secure hardware that itself can't be corrupted. Uh, we need uh, to ensure that checkers are actually controlling devices. We need cryptographic protocols. To ensure that the devices are not subverted, we need uh, a sensing of uh, attempts at tampering and something that I'll talk about a bit later called zeroization. And then to update the rules, uh, we probably need some kind of cryptographic voting protocols um, that you know meet the social needs that we're trying to achieve. And then to ensure that the rules uh, lead to human thriving, there's a whole set of technologies I won't say much about here, but uh, I've talked a lot about personal AI, social modeling, and simulation as ways of going there. So underlying all of these is mathematical proof. And I think of mathematical proof as humanity's superpower uh, against AGI. And the reason is that even the most powerful AGI can't prove a falsehood. So it's pretty much the one and only tool we have where no matter how smart these uh, AGIs get, we can always uh, sort of constrain them by, by mathematics. And humanity has been you know, working on mathematical proof for over well over 2,000 years. Uh, 350 BC, we had Aristotle and Euclid, Euclid beginning to systematize mathematical thinking. In the 1700s, Leibniz had the, this fantasy of there'd be some machine that could determine what was philosophically true. Um, in the mid-1800s, we had Boole, Cantor, and Frege that laid down the foundations of modern logic. And finally, in 1925, we had zermelo frankel set theory, ZFC, which uh, is a systematic system that is currently viewed as the tip most uh, common basis for mathematics that all of mathematics can be expressed in, and therefore all of physics can be expressed in it, all of engineering, all of computer science. Basically, any precise discipline we have today can be expressed in zermelo frankel set theory, and proofs can be very short and easy to check. Uh, in 1936, Turing uh, extended sort of logical thinking to computation. He invented the Turing machine, and he also proposed the first things for checking that programs behave the way they're supposed to. In 1980, the field of formal methods was sort of uh, really arose and started being used both for hardware and for software. In 2000, we had a whole slew of, of proof assistants, uh, HOL, Mizar, Metamath, Koch, Lean, and Isabel, but the, technology, the AI technology was not up to automatically proving theorems. And so these were assistance for human mathematicians to prove theorems. In 2020, OpenAI uh, released GPTF, which was a deep learning theorem prover that was able to, pr to prove 56, automatically prove 56% of the theorems in Metamath, which were proved by humans originally. And so uh, that has started, a, I think, a new, a new revolution there. So let me make a distinction between safety and proofs of safety, because it's somewhat subtle, uh, and, but I think it's really important. And so you can have a system which is actually safe, but if you don't have a proof of that, you never know for sure. There might be some uh, tricky little you know, way to manipulate that system so that it leads to a bad outcome. And there's no way to tell uh, unless you have a proof. For example, in software, we typically today, most uh, companies and businesses do uh, software testing. Software testing can show bugs, but it can't show the absence of bugs. And so you can test the heck out of something and say, yeah, we're really sure it's pretty good, uh, and then uh, be surprised that no, in fact, there is a bug. And so let's see, I'm just looking, I see uh, chats. Oh, okay, got it. Um, there's a Girdle completeness theorem that when applied to finite systems, it says if this system is safe, then in fact, there is a proof of it. So, uh, so safety and a proof of safety are actually related to one another. But by having the proof, it enables us to not have to trust a provider. So today, somebody says, this piece of software is really great. It has no bugs in it. You know, it's not going to leak your passwords. And, you know, yeah, you should really use this. You have to trust them. You know, you say, okay, what's the reputation? Who are the people on it? Do they have an audit? What's an audit? An audit is somebody smart, goes and looks at the code, says, yeah, it looks good to me. None of that gives you, you know, 100% guarantee. 
And it also provides an, a, an incentive for people to sneak bugs in there and to manipulate the auditors, to manipulate the providers, uh, whereas proofs could be mechanically checked and so they can automate the safety process. And um, if you don't uh, have uh, uh, have proof and you have human auditors, those auditors themselves can be manipulated by AGI. So, so that's a sort of a difference there where proof is giving us a number of positive benefits. In the paper, Max and I identified a bunch of different characteristics of uh, uh, these components that we called a provably compliant system, provably compliant hardware, proof carrying code, provable contracts, provable meta contracts. I won't go into it here, but uh, that the, there's some more more to think about there. Um, AI theorem proving is critical to this story, and uh, OpenAI really kicked it off in 2020 with GPTF. In 2022, uh, the the Fr a French research lab as a part of that was a part of Meta did Hypertree proof search. Uh, that was able, and their system was able to prove it was a large language model. Um, it was able to prove 82% of the held out meta, meta math theorems. And a group out of uh, Google has been doing a lot of work on auto formalization, which is taking human written text and creating formal models of the statements of theorems and of their proofs. And that field feels like it's just just getting going. On the cryptography side, to most of today's cryptography is not um, provably correct. Um, and in fact, uh, it looks like uh, quantum computing is going to break much of public key cryptography today. And so there's a whole risk analysis that needs to be done of how much of today's cryptography should be used in dealing with AGI, because AGI is going to be an entirely new, could potentially be much, much more powerful mathematician that may be able to break today's crypto systems unless we have proofs of it. Fortunately, there is a little teeny sub-branch of cryptography called information theoretic cryptography, uh, which is provably unbreakable. And it requires no assumptions about the power of the adversary. Uh, it is a little more inconvenient to use than typical cryptography today. It requires pre-positioned keys. So if you and I wanna talk to one another, we each have to have shared keys and the keys have to be as large as the data that we're trying to share. The simplest version of this is the one-time pad. Uh, and there's a, a variant called Shamir secret sharing, which is very powerful. And so we can do everything we need with this type of cryptography. Whether we could do it with today's cryptography, there's gonna have to be some decisions, I think. Um, Cryptographic systems, mathematical proofs, software, all has to run on hardware. That hardware become is potentially vulnerable. And so there is a sort of you know discipline of creating tamper-resistant cryptographic hardware. I think it needs to go much further than it is today. Uh, the attacks today, well, there's cryptanalysis, which is breaking the actual uh, cryptography, but side channel attacks look for leaking of information like um, you know, apparently when, when machines uh, run cryptographic algorithms, the power light uh, has a, a, a variation that uh, from 100, 100 yards away, you can watch the power light blinking and extract keys from that. So that's an example of a side channel attack, which is leaking information. Fault attacks are you inject power surges and that kind of stuff and see if you can get it to leak some information. And then invasive attacks, are you actually trying to break into the package uh, and figure out what's going on? And so uh, all kinds of techniques have been invented to deal with all of these. Dealing with AGI again, we're going to have an adversary that probably is going to be way more sophisticated than any current human adversary. And one thing I think people aren't really thinking about is every single AGI is going to be as good as the best human crypto, anal crypto analyst at crypto analysis. It's going to be as good as the, at the, the very best human hackers at breaking into systems. It's going to be as good as the best human psychologists at manipulating people. And so we're going to have a, a huge number of these attackers that are basically applying the most powerful tools ever. So I believe we actually need mathematical proof in our hardware design as well. That is, is an area that I think needs to be created and invented right now. Um, one example of good hardware is Apple. They have something called the Secure Enclave that has almost everything we need to do the provably secure system, uh, provably safe systems. Uh, and it's in their Macs, MacBooks, iPads, iPhone, Apple Watch, Apple TV, HomePod, has a built-in truly random number generator, has a unique ID, which is unique to each, each device, and it is not accessible from off-chip. So it can be used as the core of uh, cryptographic trust. 
Uh, it has built-in hardware uh, encryption, has the ability to encrypt memory off the chip, and it has some level of tamper resistance. There's a, a NIST uh, standard for that. And uh, so Apple is building that into all of their devices. And so even their watch. And so in some sense, that kind of gives a sense of the scale of something that could be uh, a potential, you know, uh, a cryptographic tool for protecting um, all the devices that we need. So zeroization is the idea. Uh, it sometimes is called tamper responsive, that if a piece of hardware is uh, attempt, somebody attempts to break in and say, read out uh, the secrets that are within that piece of hardware, uh, it should have sensors uh, that detect that. And if it detects somebody trying to break in, it deletes all the cryptographic keys. And so that makes the device inoperable, but it doesn't leak the secrets. And this is actually an old idea. Here's a picture of a, um, uh, a Soviet uh, uh, jet from, I think, the 1960s, which has a switch that if the pilot feels like he's you know, crashing or being corrupted or something, he flicks the switch and it deletes all the secrets. Uh, and I think we can extend that to not just cryptographic secrets, but also to physical uh, devices. So, for example, let's say you have a robot and an adversary is trying to take over that robot. Um, and it tries to break into the cryptographic protection of the controls of the motors, I think those motors should be designed with fuses in it. And if the system discovers or realizes, hey, I'm being uh, compromised here, it blows those fuses so the motors refuse to work. So uh, the good thing is that prevents uh, an adversary from taking over that hardware. The bad thing is it then becomes a denial service vector where in, in a battle of some sort, by attempting to break in, break the cryptography, I can also shut down the robot. And for uh, bi you know biological or chemical things, uh, I can imagine simples where biological samples you know that you always have some acid nearby, and in case of attack, the acid destroys whatever uh, bi you know biochemical thing to prevent a takeover there. So. Fleshing that story out, uh, sort of recreating our technological stack so that everything has, is managed by uh, provable rules um, is a complicated story. Lots and lots of pieces. Fortunately, I think AI will help a lot in that uh, as more powerful AI systems come on and particularly AI systems which can generate code and which can generate provably correct code with their proofs. Uh, I think the pieces that are needed for this um, can be developed a lot of it by those AIs, but it sure seems like a lot of work and a lot of hassle and it's way beyond where we currently are. Uh, do we, you know, why should we really, really do this? So I believe that if we don't do this or something equivalent to this story, that in fact, um, the system will be vulnerable. And in fact, it will be likely to be uh, taken over by malicious uh, entities. And so why is that? Well, if the system, as I said before, if the system is safe, then there exists a proof. If there, if the proof isn't explicit, then we're gonna have to make choices based on you know individuals or AI's beliefs and on some evidence, perhaps, you know, little tests and things. But AI AGIs are gonna be able to manipulate beliefs and evidence. And if humans are in the loop in making the decisions about these things. Humans are very manipulable and they're bribable. You know, hey, I'll give you a million dollars if you just, you know, check this mark and say this was good. Um, they are blackmailable, they are threatenable. And if we put a human in the loop of anything critical, we now make them a target. We make it so that human is, you know, they're in the critical loop. And so that's really not good for that human. And so we really, really want to make our design decisions in such a way that the criteria are there and the safety can be automated. And that's what the, the proof story does. And I believe if we don't do that, we're almost surely going to leave some pathway unprotected and a sufficiently intelligent entity will find that pathway and either itself or some human will maliciously take advantage of that pathway. And so I really believe we need this kind of level of protection in order to guarantee safety. How much is it worth to do this whole thing? Well, if we really believe that the you know future of humanity is dependent on this, uh, the world economy last year had a, a gross, uh, um, I guess it's not gross domestic product, gross global product or whatever, $105 trillion. Should we spend a trillion dollars for preventing human uh, risk of human extinction? $50 trillion? I don't know. Um, there are a bunch of challenge problems. Uh, and in the end of uh, Max's in my paper, we listed a whole bunch of things that we'd love people to work on. And I'll just list them here as, as suggestions for uh, thinking about it. One is to automate the process of formal verification of software. 
uh, to create verification benchmarks so that we can train AI systems uh, to do formal verification. Uh, verification of probabilistic programs, as we've uh, read in this group, uh, probabilistic programs are, are a really powerful, uh, precise expression of learning in uncertainty. We'd love to have guarantees on, you know, limits on probability of, of certain outcomes. Quantum verification, quantum computing is becoming uh, more important, and the world is quantum at base level, and so we'd love to have uh, uh, proofs of properties of quantum systems. We'd like to automate uh, mechanistic interpretability. We'd like to have mechanistic interpretability benchmarks. We'd like to uh, have provably compliant hardware, which means we need to model that hardware in a precise, provable way aligned with the uh, laws of physics. We'd like provable, provably compliant governance, and that requires modeling what's known about social interactions. Uh, there are starting to be some groups using lean to model, for example, different voting rules and that kind of thing. We want provable models for tamper detection. Uh, tampering is sort of a critical, you know, pot potential weakness of this system. And so we would like to have guarantees of detecting uh, tampering uh, from, you know, all physically possible attacks. We'd like provably valid sensors. We'd like to be able to design systems for transparency to ensure that back doors haven't been built into them. We'd like to, uh, if there is an attack, uh, presumably we have a network of these provably safe systems and we'd like the network as a whole to be robust against that attack, even though individual components with sufficient energy can always be destroyed. And so how do we uh, have provable uh, um, robustness at the network level? Uh, at a sort of more um, low level, uh, we have, uh, we'd love to have AIs which are mortal in the sense that they are guaranteed to turn off at a certain time. We'd like geofenced AIs, which are guaranteed to only operate within a certain area. We'd like throttled AIs, which are guaranteed not to use beyond a certain amount of power, uh, of compute power. We like AIs with a kill switch so that if bad things are happening, a human can say, okay, turn off now and it'll obey. Uh, we'd like things like least privilege guarantee where um, information should only go uh, where it's actually needed. And so each of these should be a whole, you know, PhD thesis and so on. Um, but I think they all would contribute to uh, the bigger the bigger challenge. And on the positive side, I think if we are successful with this story, not only do we avoid, uh, you know, human extinction and all the negative uh, things, I think um, this technology together with powerful AGI can be used to basically solve essentially every uh, human challenge that we have today. Uh, here, just as one list, here's a list of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals that the UN put out, I think in 2015 or so. And every single one of them, if you look at it, uh, is likely to be solvable using AGI, uh, assuming that the AGI itself is kept under control. So I think that I'm very optimistic about the future if we can get moving in, in a direction which will actually deal with the issues that are coming. So that's the end of my story. I'd love to answer any questions or comments. I have a long list, Steve, but um, <laughs> uh, the the first one, I think I, I liked that you mentioned AGI as an existential risk. I think that could become a rabbit hole. So I think it's good that you mentioned the AI dilemma and the Hendrix, Mizekon, Woodside paper. And then I think the way to deal with that is to say, if you don't believe it's an existential risk, go read these other topics rather than to get sidetracked into arguing with people whether it is or it isn't. I, so I think that's good. I like that approach on that part. Um, I, I, I thought when you said existential is a simpler to describe threat or specification, I wanted you to elaborate a little more. Can you say more of what you mean that it's somehow simpler to describe how to avoid uh, the end of humanity. Well, it seems like there's so many vectors that could be hard to sort of stamp out. So I'm just curious what you meant by that. Yeah. Uh, just that those vectors are more clear cut than, I mean, lots of people are also thinking about, um, you know, what should, you know, what should governments look like in the presence of AI? And, um, you know, wh what are the rules and, and how should AI support uh, you know, different uh, human, po positive human values. 
and there's a lot of subtlety there and a ton of different things. Should it be free market where freedom is the most important thing? Should it be that, you know, the, there's a base level, universal basic income, and everybody is supported at a certain level? Those are controversial and complicated with subtle, you know, the, the philosophers have all these uh, trolley problems that deal with, you know, trade-offs in, in, uh, um, uh, in, in philosophy. Whereas I think the existential questions, assuming you start with the premise that we want to prevent existential risk. And unfortunately, there are people who don't buy that. So that is a bit of an issue. But those are much more clear cut, you know, like, uh, do not release smallpox virus on the earth, do not uh, launch nukes, you know, do not. Uh, and so once you have a clear cut um, thing that you want to prevent, then you can put guardrails around it. So that's sort of what I meant by that. Got it. Okay. So yeah, it's pretty easy for us to all agree we that all of us don't want to go away. I mean, that's right. a very simple thing that across red, blue, all spectrums, pretty much, unless you're a sort of a suicide bomber type, you're, you're going to agree with that. Okay. Exactly. Thanks. That's helpful. I'll let others ask questions before I go on. You know, on that line, it seems like a lot of the, 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 the devil is, a, is, is in the details. You know, how do you um uh make a chemistry lab not create toxic stuff you know botox in small amounts is beneficial but on large amounts it's um it's toxic so so what's the what what is the um what are the rules here that we're setting yeah that a lot of subtle questions there i mean one sort of fallback position is we have that today. We have biosafety labs. Then they have criteria for you know uh, what suits you have to wear to go on in them, and um, and so at the sort of simplest level, we could just have cryptographic signatures that a certain project has been okayed by this review board or whatever. And so that's sort of like doing a, a a digital version of today's processes. Eventually, though, we would like to clarify it because already AGIs, you know, there's a there was a system to design molecules, and it had a measure for toxicity, right. and they they decided to flip the sign on that, and suddenly the thing is designing all these uh, horrible to toxic things. So so it's uh, we're entering into new territory that probably will require new rules. And somebody's got to invent those. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's, it's there needs to be a process for inventing them. And also, I mean, something I'm very interested in is, let's say we've we've figured out what we think are the right rules and we've implemented them and so on. And we've implemented them in a way that they're rigid and strict. Well, humans can't change them very easily either. We do need an upgrade path. And so we need a mechanism probably based on something like voting where you know we say you know in order to ch here's the rules for biosafety labs what they're allowed to do or not and if you want to change it we need the agreement of you know 10 of the top 20 um virologists on on this something like that um and so you need to sort of design in the upgrade path um but you need to do that in a way that it's not a uh, vulnerable though so, so I, 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 have a, I have a question uh so, you know, it looks like these rules, you know, at the high level, including at the high level, and then certainly at the lower level, you know, are very kind of um, society de society dependent, and and even you know parts of the society dependent. Like you know, even in the United States, you know, the some part, like let's say, civilian part of the society has a certain rules, you know, the safety, and then the governmental part of the society has a different rules, even safety, and these rules are changing. Sometimes, right? Whether it's legislatively or in, in some other in, in some other way, and uh, the hardware safety essentially would imply that somebody, let's say some government entity, is capable to go into the hardware and change, you know, verifiably, you know, in a verifiably uh, proved way through some on-chain, you know, technology, you know, what those rules are. But and, that, and and by the way, that's we're probably going to need that, <laughs> right? So so I think the 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 present, like it's actually a really nice presentation kind of opens up our minds as to what is needed in order to let's say survive as a as a human society, right? So but but there's that, but there are some you know consequences of this or or corollaries of this, and one consequence that I see, for example, is that we won't be able to sell hardware across the borders. Like not not all the borders, but let's say you know it means that American hardware will not be able to be sold in China, and Chinese hardware will not be able to be sold, you know, in the United States. And so these two countries have to develop completely self-contained, you know, systems that have the entire the entirety of the 
CPUs, GPUs that are and hopefully compliant on both sides, compliant with you know with the kind of AGI safety because no one because presumably everybody wants to survive and <laughs> you know in this world, but but it does like it. And then, like your, the slide on Apple, um, you know, cryptography infrastructure that's being built, you know, in in a very kind of a strong way, and that it kind of tells me that in a few years, you know, they won't be able to sell that hardware, let's say, in China, because you know that is not something that you would want. And you know, Chinese companies building Chinese CPUs and you know corresponding hardware, well, we certainly wouldn't want that hardware here, right? I, I, well, I well to... except if both if both countries are doing this um, provably safe systems, the rules are very clear. You know exactly what's in the hardware, and then you can have agreements. You can say, okay, we both agree that our you know bio lab should not make toxic viruses or whatever it is, um, and, and then you can you can be sure that their bio lab equipment and your bio lab equipment are compatible on that dimension. And so I don't know, I think it could enable even more trade because there's greater clarity. And it would also force the politicians to be very clear about exactly what are their rules and uh, ensure that the the um, technology is sort of implementing it. You know, yeah, no, ab absolutely. From a safety perspective, yes. But then, you know, that like, but imagine a situation that, you know, like the Chinese Communist Party, somebody decides to flip a switch and, and if, not, not on the safety rules, but your CPUs just won't run. <laughs> GPUs just won't run, right? With yeah, this type uh, of infrastructure, they they should be able to do so. Yeah, Corey, Corey Doctorow has a really interesting talk. It's called The Coming War on General Computation. And his yeah. kind of point of view is that um, there are some bad actors, and these days bad actors include nation states and corporations that do not, that really want to restrict what you, you are able to run on, on your computer. And so uh, implementing a, um, a, 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 a global... Um, uh, uh, structure like this would be um, really playing to the to the hands of some of some bad actors. Yeah, so that's a really interesting point that uh, this type of safety infrastructure could itself be used for negative outcomes, and that that's definitely a risk. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, you know, my general thought about computation is computation itself is almost never harmful. It's what you do with that computation. It's the actions that come out of that computation where the harm is. So uh, in some sense, unaligned AI doesn't seem so bad to me as long as that AI can't do things in the world. And so- you know, uh, Here's a, yeah, so maybe that gets around my 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 next question. It seems like there's a loophole around um, uh, Turing completeness because you could have a sign proof that your uh, computational, your GPU is only gonna compute, um, say Conway's life. But as we all know, Conway's life is Turing complete. So you can use Conway's life to simulate anything else, including the bad stuff. So um, I, I guess you spoke to that with the with the the um, thresholding. Would you call it the um, uh, the uh, you limit the CPU cycles on it or something like that? But well, any real physical system is finite. So yeah. so we sort of get, do an end run around you know uh, undecidable stuff in that way. And, and actually, I think it's probably fine to run uh, even bad stuff as long as, that, as long as it doesn't do bad things. And so the safety stuff, for me at least, is primarily about figuring out what actions in the world are potentially harmful and limiting those and, uh, and requiring, let's say you make some Conway game of life doing some fancy double simulation something, it has to generate a proof that what it wants your robot to do uh, is not harmful. So that that would be the way around that, I guess. I think uh, it might actually be essential that it be able to simulate bad actors and adversaries. So it should be able to simulate things that it doesn't want in order to figure out ways to avoid it. Yeah, That's Sorry. a great point. Really good point. Yeah, thanks, Steve, uh, and congratulations on, on the paper. Uh, although I think, uh, do you have a typo at the bottom of page four? I feel like the last item is repeated or something. Oh, is it really? There yeah. might be. <laughs> uh, but maybe uh, I like the yeah kind of self consistency of the the proposal that you guys are doing, where you know it has to emit its own proof. Uh, maybe from a more practical standpoint, like, do you guys feel like do you have sort of a toy example where it's already feasible, or do you think you know is the point here is just to encourage people to actually 
work on the technical parts to make it so that we have a concrete. So the one thing I feel like maybe that would help make everything stronger, even if someone believes the argument is some kind of concrete example, even if it's a bit of a toy where, well, if you could do the whole bit, although I guess the AI kind of generating, you know, discovering, maybe that's a bit harder, but do you feel like, what do you think is kind of the best avenue if someone actually wanted to, you know, get something concrete along these lines? That's a great point. Um, Max uh, is a professor at MIT, and he's got a bunch of students. Much, Many of his students are working on this mechanistic interpretability, yep. which is a piece of it, but it doesn't really have the full thing. And I think he's getting more excited about the um, uh, formal methods and proving software correct. Today, I don't think the current AI theorem provers have yet been really applied to uh, formal methods, the, the, the powerful ones. Um, there are, uh, so there's a big and growing group of human mathematicians and human formal methods people who are themselves building proofs of safety. And they've gotten all the way up. There's an opera, somebody's done an operating system, a small secure operating system where they've actually proven the properties of this operating system by many teams of grad students. I think So it's human <laughs> labor. And boy, I, I would love to see something like that being done automatically with AI systems. I think the AI provers haven't been applied in that way yet, but I don't think it'll be long because, um, you know, the, the large language models, uh, like everybody's looking forward to uh, DeepMind's Gemini, which is believed to be a powerful large language model, sort of like GPT-4, but with something like the AlphaGo, uh, maybe Monte Carlo Tree Search uh, uh, capabilities in there, which would maybe be applicable to theorem proving. So if somebody wanted to start today, I would say do it by hand on simple examples uh, and try and get the whole loop. Uh, and then as the AI systems for theorem proving, and I would like to see combined uh, program generation and theorem proving. So like today we have all these code language models. They're actually pretty good at generating like Python code but they do generate a lot of buggy programs too. And so for simple tasks, they can really nail it, but for anything complicated, often there's some like a path through the code that isn't quite right. So simultaneously generating the program and the proof of that program, is something they, they need anyway, and that would be well on the way toward pushing this kind of a story forward, so. I see. So you think right now it's kind of, we're at the level where we just need more of that research and demonstration. It's not at the point where we want to have kind of mass good tooling. Because uh, one one thing, if you look at, you know, deep learning and machine learning and AI, like it seems like the compute, the data and the software, you know, things like whatever, Keras Torch, whatever, it seems like it's made a big difference and has enabled so much activity that it's kind of, you know, feeding on itself and it keeps getting better. So I suspect for something like this, even if someone agrees um, they may not know where to start because, you know, some of this stuff is pretty like hardcore in the sense of theory and at least at the outset. Yeah, actually. So there's a um, there are several of these theorem provers and they have uh, communities behind them. One that's gotten a huge momentum in just the last few years is called Lean. Uh, it's originally out of Microsoft. It's a very powerful theorem prover. Uh, that's really aimed originally at mathematicians, and they're busily expressing all of modern mathematics in that. And in fact, some very leading edge theorems have been done in there. There's a big community of mathematicians, so they have millions of lines of code, uh, and they um, have toolings, which makes it pretty easy to use. It hasn't been much applied to um, proving theorems about software and hardware, but I think they have all of the, everything that's needed behind that. And many of the AI theorem provers, the deep learning theorem provers, are treating lean as their target. And they're using the, lean, the human proved lean theorems as their training set and test set. And just a, a few months ago, Lean Dojo was released, which is an, an academic project, which is open source um, deep learning model for generating lean proofs. And I don't think it's quite as good as the um, company-driven uh, ones, like the Hypertree uh, Proof Search from, from Meta seems to be the most powerful. I think it's somewhat uh, less performant than that, but it's open source. And I think it runs, it's small enough that it runs like on a, a single uh, GPU. And so that might be the tooling that could really bootstrap this whole thing forward. Do you want to cover Don? I think you got to run soon, right? Do you have a question before you go so that we can? Uh, we can oh, um, yeah. Let's see. Well, a couple of comments. A metaphor that comes up a lot for me when I think about this 
the use of proof and logic in complex systems is sort of um, the skeleton in soft tissue. If you think about a person, the skeleton to me seems like the you know logical structure or whatever. But um, and you know without it, we like we wouldn't be able to do rigid things, articulated movement. Um, but soft tissue is important, and you wouldn't want to say like everything should be skeletal. So like I feel like the tricky stuff with this is figuring out what's proper in the domain of like you're going to prove certain things about systems and what's kind of analogous to the soft tissue like what like what are the things other than proving stuff that you need to do to ever get this deployed and like an example to me that where that kind of issue comes up is just how how would we even have um you know provably legitimate secure elections that's that's not even quite an AG, agi issue but you mentioned voting as like a way that maybe changes will get deployed and the i feel like for us to have say in the united states have uh, you know trust in elections there may be a logical aspect of that like proving that the voting machines like you know cannot be corrupted or whatever but that almost seems like the easier part it seems like there's other aspects that are very difficult so i'm wondering how much you thought about what it would take to deploy these kind of methodology besides the like the logic itself yeah, I, I love your analogy that this is sort of like the skeleton. Uh, you know, that's what provides rigidity and protection for the body. But the fullness of life is not the skeleton, right? Skeletons are dead. Uh, and so I see this as uh, making the world safe for the parts of humanity that we really want, which is, you know, our creativity and love. And uh, Max said in an in interview recently, he loves the fact that we as humans have agency, that we can do different things in the world. And so my hope would be that we can wall off the truly dangerous stuff so that it's basically not possible for people to launch nukes or release smallpox. And in the space that remains, we have the uh, you know richest, fullest utopian human existence possible and that we don't disallow, um, as long as somebody isn't doing something which is harmful to others, that they can do whatever they want and they can explore the reaches of humanity. And I think AI and AI technology could be really, really helpful for that also. But if we, if we don't protect against the downside, we won't get to that. And so I, I would love to brainstorm and think about that part. And maybe some of the proof stuff will be helpful there. Currently, I, I think I can see more clearly how the proof things work for rigidly defined stuff. So like in the elections, I think the proof stuff could easily nail down, you know, everybody is absolutely sure that the elections are counted properly, but it's not going to detect subtle manipulation of people's thinking through you know uh, the smells wafting in the the you know the, down the streets or something like that so so the softer part of what people think about is is much harder to cover i think yeah so um yeah i i need need to run great talk i really enjoy this and i'm glad i can watch the recording and see the the rest of the discussion um just a final thought about like a possible case study area that comes to mind is um, aviation safety, um, because there's a there's sort of a long tradition of like aviation and how do you deal with provable systems. But now as they, you know, use machine learning to try to automate more things, how do you how do you prove you, uh, how do you deal with that? But also because there's a the the non hardware non you know the, like the the um, infrastructure the organizational infrastructure of the FAA and and so on is kind of in place. So it, it, it could be an interesting to look for a case study there. Anyway, great talk. I really enjoyed it and uh, talk with you soon. Great. Thanks for coming. Yeah, the aviation example is interesting because a jet yesterday, the pilot ejected from some a fighter jet and they lost track of the jet. They didn't know where the <laughs> jet was. It's like, what? How could that happen? <laughs> Yeah, I think they found the wreckage, I think, you know, because I saw the room was, oh, it's in Cuba now. It's like, uh, this, the whole Twitter went off. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I have another question if nobody else who hasn't talked yet doesn't have one. Um, so I think I have a handle on a lot of, a lot of the sort of like the, the voting and how changing the rules or changing sort of the constitution, the skeleton has to be fairly infrequent. And so therefore you could probably crowdsource it with enough experts open source to kind of make sure that that meets a certain level of quality. There's probably a seasoning time or something 
So that makes sense to me. Um, and all the rest in terms of automation seems like it's doable compute wise. But the one thing that caught my eye was your, you know, it's a little more inconvenient to do the, the type of cryptography, cryptography where keys need to be as large as the information being discussed. And so I want, I don't know if you want to say any more about that. It might just be a whole area of research that needs a lot more time spent on it. But I'm curious, are we, is there an incomputability, like, like we're, it's, it's too uh, intractable or is there, you think there's a solution there? Well, I actually have a little startup called Quantum Properties Inc. where we're actually working on on that. And the, the the observation there is that you can have little chips with you know terabytes on them these days, and so you just load up a couple of chips with a, a common key on two chips, and there are ways to do that very very securely. And then you can just dis distribute them to people. And you know it's important for for world changing things. If something could potentially be a human. Uh, extinction risk, you probably want to use the very best cryptography. And so like one-time pads were used back in the 60s, I think, between the White House and the Kremlin, because those messages were really critical. Yeah, Whereas in, in, uh, in, in World War II, the, the, it was all analog. And the one-time pads were on um, uh, uh, disks, which they carefully destroyed after using them. So Perfect. Perfect. Well, that's one of the principles is as you use the data, the, the keys, you destroy them. And, and so it re really is quite, quite nice, but it's somewhat expensive and, and having to physically uh, deliver the, the data. Uh, the densities are so high though, that it's, you know, it's sort of an inconvenience now rather than something really bad. And probably for, you know, you're downloading your favorite movie, it's probably not worth doing that. But for anything which has real, financial, military, uh, political, or survival significance, I think then then we really do need to think about uh, extremely high levels of security. The other uh, piece is if, if, it, if you have proofs of the uh, of the cryptographic strength, you can you can be sure there isn't a back door. If it's just somebody say so that yeah 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 this is a really good encryption algorithm who knows what they've hidden there you know and there are examples of things with back doors in it and so this is a way to prevent that as well. And the only thing that quantum computing is purported to solve is public key cryptography, not uh, individual you know thousand or two thousand long uh, completely random uh, keys that are. Yeah. Well, I mean, one time pad is probably unbreakable. Um, right. There is a um, uh, there's Grover's algorithm, which uh, uh, gives a square root speed up of quantum computing on, you know, sort of general like inverting hash functions and stuff like that. But probably that stuff with longer keys and so on is probably safe. But, you know, all bets are off with AGI, right? AGI is going to be a whole new creature, and we we can sort of guess what maybe it'll be like. We don't really know. And so the more we can do with mathematical proof, I think the better it will be. <laughs>